Okay, everything ready? Good morning, everybody. Welcome again for this new colloquium at the Instituto de Astrofísica de Andalucía. Okay, in Granada, in Spain. Good morning, everybody. Oops. Welcome again for this new colloquium. All right. Uh, today we will have the talk by Dr. Philip Sarka, and uh, he will talk about star planet plasma interactions and radio emission. And uh, Professor Sarka will be properly introduced by Isabel Marquez. So please, Isabel. Thank you very much, Rene. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here again. And uh, first of all, thank you very much, Professor Sarka, for accepting our invitation. Uh, Professor Philip Sarka is a Director de Recherche uh, Première Classe uh, at the Laboratory Lesia, and he's also Deputy Director of the Nancy Radio Observatory, both affiliated to the CNRS Observatoire de Paris. He obtained his PhD in Astrophysics in 1984 from the Université de Paris 6, uh, and he is Permanent Research Scientist as a, as a CNRS, the CNRS since 1985, so just the day after. He was involved as co-investigator of the Planetary and Solar International Space Missions, Voyager, Ulysses, Cassini, Stereo, Juno, Bepi, Colombo, and Jews. And since 1983, he co-authored uh, more than 300 refereed publications uh, with a total of more than 13,000 citations with an H8 index of about 60. And he has also wrote uh, three um, three papers or chapters in, in books and, and has been editor as well. He gave more than more than 80 invited talks at international conference and, and about 100 seminars in national and foreign labor laboratories. In, he has in fact numerous collaborations in France, in the rest of Europe, in USA, Brazil, Asia and Africa. He has supervised about a dozen postdoc and a similar number of, of pre-doc students and uh, even a higher number of master students and many, many other uh, undergraduate students between 1990 and today, and also uh, supervising engineers um, in CDD in Nancy and Medon. Among his former PC and postdocs, uh, um, uh, among, I mean, most of them have now permanent re research positions, and, and even three of them are professors. His main fields of interest um, are radio astronomy, both ground-based and space-based, and plasma physics applied to planetary and exoplanetary physics concerning atmospheres, ionospheres, magnetospheres, theorem detection of radio emissions, and also the sun, pulsars, and fast radio bursts. And today, as Ren said, he will talk uh, as about the star planet, plasma interactions, and radio emissions. Uh, thank you again, uh, Professor Sarka, for, for being here and I extend this invitation to a when you will be able, when we'll be able for you to come here to visit us at the IAA. Thank you very much. And the board is yours. Thank you very much, Isabel, for this introduction. Uh, so this is uh, the subject of today's talk. And uh, this is the outline of uh, this talk. Uh, each part will be quite brief, except the third one, mostly. So I'll talk about radio emissions, detectability, uh, the drivers for the emission which are star planet interaction and then extrapolate to exoplanets and uh, do, say a few words about motivation comments. And if I have time at the end, say a few words about observations. So first about planetary radio emissions, this uh, very short movies actually uh, set the, uh, the stage of uh, the context of the interaction of the sun with the solar system planets, the earth to the left and Jupiter to the right. And uh, you can see that actually uh, there is an interaction of the solar wind with the magnetic field of these planets that creates a kind of a bubble that is the magnetosphere. And this magnetosphere uh, that, that can be extremely large in the case of Jupiter, for example, you can see that the tail of the Jupiter magnetosphere almost reaches Saturn orbit, actually. And uh, these magnetospheres are uh, uh, particle accelerators, and uh, in particular, they accelerate electrons to KeV and even MeV energy, but we are interested with KeV in the high latitude regions. And these electrons follow magnetic field lines and uh, they will uh, end for part of them in uh, near the poles, the magnetic poles of the planets. And near the poles of these planets, they will precipitate. They will create this beautiful uh, UV aurora that you can see here at Jupiter, for example. And I will come back to this image later to detail a little more it. And above the aurora, 
you have uh, radio emissions that are produced by electrons along the field lines and that, that I sketch here with cones of emission. And again, I will come back to this later. So uh, in the case of Jupiter, Jupiter is the only, you will see why in a minute, is the only uh, planet for which the radio emission can be studied from the ground, from the Earth, ground-based radio telescope. And as it is very intense, uh, the emission is easily detectable with a relatively small instrument. For example, here is the LWA uh, in New Mexico, and uh, we can measure the intensity of the emission versus time, versus frequency, versus polarization in color here. And uh, we can, uh, on the ground, we are not limited by the performance of the receiver. And we can go, uh, for example, to very uh, fine structure here, a sub-second structure of the emission, that is the structures in bursts. And all this tells us a lot about how the radio emission is done. Moreover, not only, for example, we have a lot of radio observation, for example, for solar bursts since a long time, but still no consensus about how these bursts are, are produced. And this is in part because we could not go into the source of radiation and make measurements in this source. In the case of planets, we could do so. So many uh, satellites went into the, the auroral radio source of the Earth and made detailed measurements. And here I show you uh, more recent ones uh, that were done by Cassini at Saturn. So Cassini passed here in the red spot uh, in the, uh, at a few radii from Saturn in the radio sources. And I will not detail this complex plot, but it's just to tell you that we have an exquisite uh, details uh, about the, uh, the emission, uh, so radio waves in the top panel. The uh, dashed white line is uh, local cyclotron frequency. And you can see that when we cross the source in the red square, the radio emission actually touches and even go below, goes below the local cyclotron frequency. And at the same time, we can measure electrons in the source and we could measure KeV, so about 10 KeV electrons here. And this can be put together and really constrain very well the theoretical emission mechanism. And actually, if you put together all uh, the uh, remote and local observations, you can summarize the properties of the uh, radio emission from solar system planets as uh, this short list. They are extremely intense, uh, very high power, very high brightness temperature. They are produced at the local cyclotron frequency, so that is proportional to the magnetic field. But as this frequency decreases when you go away from the planet, they also cover a broad range of frequency from a maximum cyclotron frequency at the surface down to very low frequency far from the planet. They are strongly circularly polarized. Uh, this corresponds to X mode, uh, so the, the extraordinary, extraordinary mode uh, in the case of uh, when you compare with the hemisphere of origin of the emission. So the X mode actually for, uh, for a diluted plasma where the plasma frequency is smaller than the cyclotron frequency, the X mode has a cutoff just above the cyclotron frequency here in a cold plasma. And when the plasma is hot, the cutoff of the X mode can go down slightly below the cyclotron frequency, actually. Uh, this so the sources of the emission are found at high latitude near the magnetic poles. And the beaming of the emission is not, an, not isotropic. It's very anisotropic. It's beam at large angle from the magnetic field in sort of uh, hollow cones of emission, just a few degrees thick. The emission is correlated with the UV emission below it, and it's modulated at many scales. There are bursts at a sub-second scale, as we have seen. They are strongly modulated by the rotation of the planet, mostly because of the anisotropic beaming that sweeps like a pulsar, actually, the observer. They are uh, controlled, as we will see, by solar wind, by coronal mass ejection from the sun, or the nearby star, basically. This uh, uh, bottom left plot is a, a summary of the spectra of the uh, radio emission from the various planets of the solar system. Only those which are magnetized uh, produce some uh, radio emissions because it's cyclotron emission. And the, the shaded blue, the blue shaded area is the uh, uh, below 10 megahertz. It's not observable from the ground because of the cutoff by the ionosphere of the Earth. And you see that most of the emission below uh, lie below this, uh, this cutoff. So because the magnetic field of the various planets are uh, weak, typically of the order of a Gauss, the emission does not exceed one or two megahertz. Whereas only for Jupiter, the uh, magnetic field goes up to 14 Gauss, and thus the radio emission can go up to 40 megahertz here and so be observable from the ground. And then, of course, uh, when you reach the cyclotron frequency, the maximum cyclotron frequency at the surface of the planet, 
the emission is uh, quickly quenched. And then you go down to synchrotron and thermal emission, which is not the topic of today's talk. So with all these constraints uh, and the in-situ measurements, a very detailed theory of generation of this emission could be uh, done, actually, could be uh, created. And it has been summarized in a very nice review paper by Wu and Troyman here. And uh, actually, this is a cyclotron emission, but uh, cyclotron maser emission, so so-called cyclotron maser instability. It requires low beta magnetized plasma, so with the plasma frequency much smaller than cyclotron frequency. KV electrons that are not at equilibrium. And these are examples, this is, uh, these are displays. The horizontal axis is the velocity parallel to the magnetic field. The vertical axis is the velocity perpendicular to the magnetic field. Uh, the zero is here. If you have a Maxwellian, you would have a half disk uh, decreasing to the outside. You see that we you can observe many different uh, non-Maxwellian features in the magnetosphere of the planets. One is the so-called loss cone. This is a downgoing electron, this is upgoing electrons. And when the downgoing electrons precipitate to the atmosphere, they are lost by collision and they don't come up in the upgoing part for the electron that have a, a very parallel speed to the magnetic field. And so this is called the loss cone. So there is a, basically no electron here. When you have an acceleration parallel to the field at some places and then an adiabatic motion of the electron, you create this kind of shells and rings of particles. And all these are very nice uh, features to produce the emission. Uh, the conditions are met at high magnetic latitudes. The emission, the cyclotron maser emission is direct emission. So electrons to electromagnetic wave directly at the local cyclotron frequency or rather at the local X mode frequency that is very close to it. And that is proportional to the magnetic field. And the predictions are very consistent with the observation, intense, broadband, sporadic, anisotropic, circularly polarized emission, and up to a few percent of the electron energy can go into the radio waves. So without going into the, the, the detailed math of the mechanism, a lot of papers are devoted to it. There is a resonance condition between the wave frequency, the cyclotron frequency of the electron corrected by the Lorentz factor, and the uh, parallel velocity of the electron. So it's the frequency in the frame uh, of the wave or the wave frequency in the frame of the electrons. And uh, this resonance condition in this velocity space uh, corresponds to circles. And uh, the growth rates, so to amplify the, the emission, is some integral. And the most important that is, it is that it is the integral along these resonance circles of the derivative of the electron distribution in to the perpendicular direction. So when you have positive gradients in the perpendicular direction, you are able to amplify the wave. And for example, you have positive gradients at the place of these arrows at the edge of the loss cone or below the shell of accelerated electrons. And so it can be demonstrated that the center of this uh, resonance circle is related to the uh, propagation angle of the wave relative to the magnetic field. And uh, there is a relation between these angles and the loss cone angle and finally, you can see that when you have a loss cone driven radio emission, it consists in waves that are oblique with respect to the magnetic field because the resonance circle is shifted relative to zero. When you are amplified by the shell electrons, you can produce emission per perpendicular to the magnetic field because the resonance circle is centered on zero. And based on the cyclotron maser, we could, with colleagues from LESIA, develop a simulation code called EXPRESS, Exoplanetary and Planetary Radio Emission Simulator. And it is a geometric, uh, geometric code, except that the beaming of the emission is uh, controlled by the cyclotron maser equations. And so this is, for example, an observation of Jupiter, so-called radio arcs, so the shape that takes the emission in, in the time frequency plane. And this is a corresponding simulation with EXPRESS with uh, very few free parameters. And this is another simulation that is compared to Juno observation at high latitudes. And you can see that the um, simulation is doing quite well in describing the shape of the emission. But it does not describe the emission intensity that depends on the detail of the distribution function. And so it's very difficult to predict from first principle, I mean, without going to the source, actually. So, we have many radio sources in the solar system. It was very tempting 
to look for uh, the equivalent of this source for exoplanets. And so what is the detectability of this source? Jupiter is very intense. And so what is the detectability? This is again the uh, spectra from, from solar system planets with in a, a thick line, the Jupiter spectrum average and burst. And this is synchrotron and thermal. You have various strong radio sources uh, of the sky, the spectra that are represented here. This is a figure taken by from Krauss. And you can see uh, immediately that uh, Jupiter and generally uh, planetary emission are extremely intense. They are more intense than most radio sources in the sky. And in particular, uh, they are here as intense or within one order of magnitude as the most intense solar radio burst. And so the contrast between Jupiter and its parent star is very small. It's one order of magnitude. Whereas if you compare, for example, in the infrared or in the visible, the contrast be between the planet and the star, uh, you have emitted light in the infrared, reflected light in the visible. The contrast is 1 million to 1 billion, actually, with respect to a factor of 10. So the radio range seems quite favorable. And as in addition, it corresponds to the so-called radio window, the, uh, the window in which the atmosphere is uh, transparent between typically uh, 10 megahertz and uh, a few hundred gigahertz. It is a very uh, favorable uh, place, uh, we think, to look for radio emission for exoplanets. But the problem is that, as you can see here, the sky background is very uh, strong too. And so it's a statistical fluctuation. So the sky temperature can be described, the galactic temperature can be described by this formula with F, the frequency in megahertz. And so this will uh, be affected by statistical fluctuation that will depend on the effective area for our telescope, the bandwidth and the time integration of the observations. And if you take Jupiter as a, a reference, so with its flux of 10 to 8, the Jansky at, uh, for the, 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 the more or less peak flux or intense flux at 1 AU, you can uh, have, have a very, uh, easy, uh, very simple formulas that describe the maximum distance at which you can detect a signal that is C times Jupiter with a given effective area, or the effective area, minimum effective area that you need to detect a signal that, that is at distance d, again, a, a, signal, a signal that is C times Jupiter. And these are uh, uh, examples with just one time Jupiter, so Jupiter itself, with five sigma detection. If you want to detect with a 100,000 square meter array, it's a large array, it's typically low far, for example, of, or UTR2, and it will be exceeded by the future SKA. This is various, uh, this is a frequency in megahertz, various values of the product uh, bandwidth by time integration, uh, 10 megahertz, one hour, three megahertz, one minute, one megahertz, one second. And you see that the maximum distance is small actually for that. You, can, you cannot detect Jupiter at more than a fraction of a parsec or one parsec, but it does not emit above 40 megahertz here anyway. So it's not favorable. So if uh, you look uh, in another way, which kind of effective area you need to be able to detect at five sigma Jupiter at a distance of five parsecs. Again, you see that you need typically many square kilometer. So this is not really favorable. So actually we have to understand what are the emission drivers and can we, because we cannot predict intensity, can we have scaling law that will give us indirect predictions? And from this, can we extrapolate to exoplanets? So this uh, took me uh, several years actually of work. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, I identified several uh, mechanisms that uh, are at the source of radio emission. One is, of course, the solar wind magnetosphere interaction that gives rise to radio emission in the magnetosphere, the one I showed you, the spectra mostly. This is a super alvenic interaction. So there is a bow shock because the wind is faster than the uh, fast and alvenic uh, modes. And uh, it was found in, uh, in, in observation from a spacecraft, from Voyager, from many. Uh, so from several planets, here the Earth, here Saturn, that there is a strong correlation between some solar wind parameters, the pressure, the velocity, and the auroral radio emission. For example, here at the Earth, correlation between solar wind speed and the, the flux of the auroral kilometric radiation from the Earth. Here, a very nice correlation between the solar wind pressure and the Saturn radio emission. And here, an illustration at some point during the Voyager 2 flyby of Saturn, Saturn was uh, actually uh, inside the tail of the magnetosphere of Jupiter. So the solar wind was just cut off and the radio emission was also cut off. So there is a strong correlation here. So what, how can we quantify this correlation? 
So actually, uh, with, uh, when only the Earth, Saturn, and Jupiter radio emission were known, Desch and Kaiser, in a Nature paper, uh, just uh, found that this point could be aligned in a diagram where you have the radio power on one axis in log scale, and some quantity that is related to the low solar wind pressure, like, for example, the size of the magnetopause in abscissa, or the power of the solar wind on the magnetopause. And there was some alignment. And the ratio between the, the input power from, sorry, the, from the total power from solar wind and the radio emission was 10 to the minus 5, so very small ratio. And this was used to make predictions for Uranus that uh, actually worked not so bad. And Uranus was in this, this range, and Neptune also, I will show you the, the thing. But uh, it's not obvious, I mean, why there is a correlation with, uh, from, between the radio power and the, the incident solar wind that is typically made of uh, sub electron volt. Uh, particles. And so actually, when you look at the solar wind that is expanding at a quasi constant speed with a number of density uh, decreasing as one over, one over distance square, radial, flux, radial magnetic field the same, uh, azimuthal magnetic field of one over the distance, uh, because uh, the spiral becomes more and more uh, uh, azimuthal with the distance. Actually, you found that the square of the magnetic field, that is the pointing flux, the magnetic field pressure, varies as the uh, density by uh, the kinetic energy in the solar wind. So actually, the uh, kinetic power and the pointing flux, the magnetic power, vary the same way in the solar wind. And the ratio between the two of them is approximately 170 beyond the orbit of the Earth. So actually, based on that, uh, okay, you can compute the radius of the magnetopause from pressure equilibrium between the outside and the inside. And then you can compute the kinetic energy flux from solar wind on the magnetopause cross section. And you get, when you add the, ob the observation from Uranus and Neptune, so here you have the overall radio power in uh, ordinate that is integrated over time, uh, frequency, and beaming. And the incident kinetic flow power in abscissa, you have very nice correlation. Here I separated the hectometer and decameter emission from Jupiter, but it's not very important. But you can do the same with the pointing flux, because I, as I said, the, the functional variation is the same. And actually, you have the same correlation between the radio power and the incident magnetic power or pointing flux on the magnetopause. And you have this expression for the pointing flux and this uh, efficiency that is smaller because the magnetic flux is smaller for the same radio power. Okay, and then I tried to, in this 2007 paper, I tried to categorize actually uh, the, the various categories of flow obstacle interaction as a function of the magnetic field of the flow and the magnetic field of the obstacle. So when the, for a weakly magnetized uh, flow like solar wind and a strongly magnetized obstacle that the solar system planet that have magnetic field, you have a magnetospheric interaction with aurora radio emission produced, as I just described. But then you have other drivers of radio emission that are very interesting to study in the solar system. This is a very nice sketch published recently by Zale et al. And um, the uh, moons of Jupiter interact with the main rotating magnetic field of Jupiter and by the way of Alvin wings. So Alvin waves are produced by the perturbation of the magnetic field that pro propagate along field lines, accelerate electrons, and finally, this accelerated electron gives rise to UV and radio emissions. And um, this interaction can be summarized, for example, here you have IO, magnetic field line that arrives because IO has an ionosphere. There is a magnetic perturbation that propagates along the field line at the uh, Alvin speed, and the envelope of this perturbation is the so called Alvin wings uh, that uh, carry currents and that uh, can accelerate particles to the planet. And this is a sketch of the interaction. And indeed, at the footprint of this uh, Alvin wings, you can see. So this is uh, the, uh, the oval here is the main oral oval that is due uh, to the magnetosphere ionosphere coupling or magnetosphere solar wind coupling, depending on the planet. And here you, hear very, you, hear, you see very bright spot related to the Io-Jupiter interaction. So at the other end of the magnetic field line here, you are at the vicinity of Io, and you have the same for Ganymede and Europa here. And you have very strong and structured radio emission in the time frequency plane that are also identified with this Io induced emission. Io is not magnetized. So actually, uh, it was possible to compute what is the dissipated power by, by this interaction. So there is a potential drop 
perpendicular to IO because of the electric field of the V cross B, velocity of the flow and magnetic field of Jupiter. You have no solar wind in this story. You are inside the magnetic field of Jupiter and the size of the obstacle. And finally, uh, I showed in, uh, in a, a paper in 2001 that the expression from Neubauer 1980 could be put in a very simple form. Uh, basically, the pointing flux here, uh, multi, uh, so velocity multiplied by the magnetic energy, multiplied by the size, the cross section of the obstacle, and some parameter that is uh, less than one here that is actually uh, equal to this value and that is comprised between the Alvin Mach number and one. And for the uh, Jupiter moon, the interaction is subalvenic. The Alvin Mach number for the, in, in this case is 0.2 to 0.3. And so the dissipated power is just a fraction epsilon of this pointing flux on the obstacle. So this is the case of a strongly magnetized flow interacting with a weakly or not magnetized obstacle. And it's the so-called unipolar interaction where the, the satellite plays the role of the engine to extract a power from the magnetic field that is in rotation. But then there is a slightly different case. That is when the satellite itself still in interacting with Jupiter magnetic field is itself magnetized like is the case for Ganymede. You have the same kind of Alvin wave and a uh, uh, spot in UV here and radio emissions, but you also have a magnetosphere by itself that uh, recon with the magnetic field of Ganymede reconnecting with the Jovian magnetic field. You, ha you have aurora on Ganymede itself. You have reconnection sites from between the magnetic field of Ganymede and the magnetic field of Jupiter. And finally, the result is that the interaction is very similar to the IO interaction, except that the obstacle now in the flow will be the entire magnetosphere of Ganymede, that, uh, whose radius is 3 to 3.5 times the radius of Ganymede. So it's a much larger obstacle. And besides that, okay, you have a, a coefficient that is close to 1, that is just the, the, the direction of the magnetic field that is adapted to reconnection, which is the case for Jupiter, because at the orbit of Ganymede, the magnetic field of Jupiter and the magnetic field of Ganymede are opposed, so they can recon reconnect. And you have, again, a dissipated power that is related to the flow of pointing flux on the obstacle, multiplied by an efficiency that was estimated by various authors to be 0.1 to 0.2. And this was the case of the so-called dipolar interaction. So when you have both a strongly magnetized obstacle and a strongly magnetized flow that interacts. So in summary, of, of course, this, uh, this is a very short summary. When you have a, 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 sub, a super alvenic uh, flow obstacle interaction like magnetosphere, you have a pointing flux on the obstacle and the dissipated power can be taken as a fraction that we don't know of this pointing flux. You have an Io-Jupiter interaction through alvin waves with a dissipated power that is a fraction epsilon that is typically uh, 0.2, 0.3 of this uh, pointing flux. And in the case of Ganymede, the fraction is between 0.3 and 0.2. So in all cases, we have the same kind. It seems to appear that we have the same kind of relationship with the pointing flux driving actually the flow with an efficiency factor that is uh, smaller than one, of course, and in, in the order of tens of percent. And that could be applied to all uh, flow obstacle interactions. And of course, when you have no magnetic field in the flow nor in the obstacle, you don't expect to have cyclic emission because just you have no magnetic field, so uh, no interaction, no production of radio waves. So uh, with recent, this was done in uh, between 2001, 2007. Uh, in the meantime, there were better observation of the spectrum of uh, Jupiter emission with Cassini, so more quantitative measurements here. Uh, better quantitative measurements of the IO Jupiter signal of the, the detection and measurement of the Ganymede Jupiter induced radio signals. So this uh, so-called the longitude of observer phase of satellite are diagrams that allow to identify the source that are related to IO related to Ganymede here. So I won't go into details, only if you have questions. And then uh, we could add these points uh, more or less accurately measured from the IO Jupiter and Ganymede induced uh, radio emissions and compare the radio power that we measure in all case with either the incident, incident kinetic power on the obstacle that is very small in the case of Io and Ganymede because the obstacle, because there is not much plasma in the magnetosphere of Jupiter, or to the incident pointing flux. And you see that as we suspected from the previous slide, actually, it is the uh, radio power versus the incident magnetic uh, power, so pointing flux, that uh, gives uh, an alignment of all the points here. 
even if the detailed physics is different in the various interaction, we have a kind of macroscopic uh, relationship with a slope that is uh, near one and an efficiency that is about two ten to the minus three. So between the radio power and the point influx, that seems to organize all known radio emission in the solar system. So this is quite interesting because it tells us that even if we are not able to uh, actually uh, predict the intensity of the radio emission from first principle, we may have a scaling law that will guide our uh, predictions. And so when you want to extrapolate to exoplanets, you look at the census we have now. Uh, so this slide was updated yesterday evening. So we have, uh, so I hope it's not, uh, it's still valid. We have more than 1,000 exoplanets in uh, more than 300, 700 uh, systems. So part of them multiple, a lot detected by transit. We have a 15% fraction that is really hot Jupiters, closer than 10 radii from their star, and uh, another 15% between 10 and 20 radii from the star. This is a website where you can find all the statistics. And we have uh, 180 hot Jupiters with a periastron that is closer to 5 to 10 uh, uh, solar radii. And on the, on the stellar side, uh, we know that uh, in for the sun, the magnetic field, the large scale field is order of one Gauss, but we, we can have loops that can go to a thousand Gauss over a few percent of the surface. And we have magnetic, magnetic stars uh, uh, of which the magnetic field uh, can be, the, the large scale magnetic field can go to hundreds of thousands of Gauss also. So this is, uh, so what I did in this, uh, the, the, this was preliminary paper, the astrophysics space science paper of 2001, and the more developed uh, planetary and space science paper of 2007, what I did actually is just to keep the sun as a star. And so to see what happens when uh, you take Jupiter close to the sun with uh, parameters from the plasma from the solar environment. So this is uh, the distance in log scale in uh, stellar radii. So uh, the Earth is as, uh, it, that is as 213 uh, solar radii, Jupiter a, a little above 1000 solar radii. And this is how the electron density of solar wind varies with the distance to the sun. There is some uncertainty close to the sun, but the, the, it's approximately true. And this is how the solar wind speed varies. And it's very interesting because solar wind speed is here. So it, it's, there is the acceleration region within five to 10 radii where the solar wind is accelerated. And then the speed basically is constant uh, over the solar system. But actually, this is true in the, uh, in the solar frame, actually. When you are in the, uh, in, in, uh, interested in a planet uh, frame, you have the orbital velocity of the planet that is dictated by Kepler's law. And the combination of the two gives this velocity in the planetary frame. So even when we are very close to the sun, the velocity does not go to zero uh, in the planet frame because of the aberration effect, because of the uh, orbital motion of the planet that combines with the flow speed. So this is how the uh, magnetic field along the spiral and the various velocities combine, actually. Uh, this is the velocity in the, in the planetary frame, the perpendicular field in the planetary frame. And this is the various angle between the velocity V and the solar wind velocity with the distance from the sun, and the angle between the magnetic field along the spiral and the radial uh, uh, direction uh, along the spiral here. And you can see that there is uh, some distance here, about 40 radii, where the magnetic field is purely radial. So when you look at the interplanetary magnetic, magnetic field, you have the azimutal and the radial component that here, but you can compute from this and this geometry the perpendicular magnetic field in the planet frame. And this is the one that will enter in the pointing flux and appears here because of this combination of angles at uh, 30 to 40 solar radii a kind of uh, what was called by Joachim Sauer later, a corridor of vanishing motional electric field, and so vanishing in a uh, perpendicular uh, magnetic field here. That is uh, due to this geometry, and that appeared first in this, in this paper here. So with, this, uh, with these parameters, electron density, uh, velocity, uh, magnetic field, perpendicular magnetic field, we can compute the kinetic uh, power per unit area and the uh, pointing flux or magnetic power per unit area versus the distance in the solar system. And you can see that whereas the uh, kinetic energy flux gently increases when you go closer to the sun as typically one over distance square, it's true indeed, that's what I said at the beginning for the uh, pointing flux when you are beyond the Earth's distance, when you, when you get closer uh, than the corridor typically, then the increase is much stronger. It's in one over distance to the fourth. 
because the radial magnetic field plays a role in the uh, perpendicular field in the point in flux. If you take into account the fact that when you take Jupiter closer to the sun, the magnetopause will shrink because the magnetosphere will sustain a higher power from the outside. And so the, uh, the radius of the magnetosphere will decrease, still remain much smaller than the star planet distance. So it remains detached from the star. Then you can combine all this to compute the total dissipated power on the obstacle, uh, either kinetic or pointing flux magnetic. And in the realm of hot Jupiters, uh, you're here, typically five to 10 radii. And you can see that from if you, if the, the, the power dissipated at Jupiter from solar wind is one, then the kinetic power increased by uh, 1000 when you go to hot Jupiter and by, sorry for the, the small uh, format problem, to, from 10 to the five <clears throat> due to the pointing flux. So if our scaling law that we determine is indeed uh, concerned by the ratio, the relation between the radio power and the pointing flux, we have a reservoir uh, basically of 10 to the five in uh, uh, pointing flux power and so in radio power for hot Jupiters. In addition, an interesting remark is that uh, when you look at the Alven uh, Mach number, uh, uh, when you go from close to the sun to the to far from the sun, you can see that as the orbit of the Earth or Jupiter, typically the flow is super alvenic and the Alven Mach number is uh, several units and about 10. Whereas when you are in the hot Jupiter regime, uh, the flow becomes sub alvenic because uh, the velocity decreases. And so you are in a situation that is uh, relatively uh, similar to uh, the Io Jupiter or Ganymede Jupiter interaction, but you have a problem because of the solar corona uh, that is uh, dense and th that is decreasing much more slowly than the magnetic field of the sun in the solar wind, the ratio of the plasma to cyclotron frequency in the solar corona is too large for allowing cyclotron maser, except in strongly magnetized loops. So for the one Gauss average field, it's not good because you have the plasma frequency dependent that is here and the cyclotron frequency that is below it and that's too low. It's only if the uh, magnetic field is 10 or 100 times higher then that indeed you can have a ratio of FP over FC that is favorable for cyclotron laser in the hot Jupiter range. And so in order to have radio emission induced by uh, uh, the orbital body, the, the, the body in orbit with respect to the star, uh, you need to have a, a, a stellar magnetic field that is much larger or 10 to 100 times larger than the sun and in this case, because the induced radio emission will be in the stellar field, you can have an emission that is at higher frequency than the emission from Jupiter. And so in this case, the exoplanet can be a strong driver, not an emitter by itself, but a driver of radio emission in the star's magnetic field. In the case uh, where the, the two bodies are uh, magnetized, like Ganymede and Jupiter, so like a planet and a star strongly magnetized, you will be in a system that is very similar to interacting magnetic binaries. And in the recent years, so this was an old paper by Ip et al. 2004, and uh, that, uh, that looked at the topology of the magnetic field of the planet relative to the magnetic field of the star. So uh, align, anti-align, radial, and so on, and to, to uh, compute uh, shape of the uh, magnetic environment of the planet in the stellar magnetic field. So with various topology, closed, open, or radial. And this was redone uh, with a, in a much uh, more fancy way and detailed way by, in a series of papers by Strugarek and collaborators. And this is an example where you have the star, its magnetic field, and depending on the align, anti-align, or perpendicular nature of the orientation of the planetary magnetic field, you can have different uh, shape of magnetosphere and interactions uh, with a connection or not of uh, the, the planet to the star. Uh, directly along the magnetic field lines. So finally, um, if uh, you, <clears throat> I would say, believe this uh, prediction, this scaling law that was obtained for solar system planets, and so the radio power is uh, proportional to the incident magnetic power or pointing flux here, and you want now to uh, just uh, draw a line through this, so either the line you take a slope one or you take the best fit that is close to one, and you extrapolate this to the kind of uh, pointing flux that will experience hot Jupiter uh, due to star planet interaction, then you have predictions of radio power that of course are also 
uh, 10 to the five times uh, larger than Jupiter's actually. And uh, this slope has, uh, this, uh, this line has a slope one and uh, again, a proportionality parameter about 10 to the minus three. And this 10 to the minus three, you can understand it as 20% efficiency of uh, dissipation of the point in flux at the planet. And then uh, from the accelerated electron that comes from this dissipated power, maybe 1% going into radio waves. And so without making a detailed calculation, this is uh, the kind of uh, number that we have. And uh, this 10 to the five, of course, was for a solar type star. star. But uh, in addition, if you have a star that has a magnetic field higher than the sun, uh, then you will have uh, this 10 to the five factor that is affected in addition by the ratio of the magnetospheric size with that of the star and the stellar magnetic field with respect to that of the sun. So you can go to 10 to the six or more. This is, of course, if there is no saturation uh, that uh, prevents this, uh, these powers to go to such high values. And if the magnetic field of, uh, in the case of uh, magnetospheric emission, in the magnetic field of the planet, uh, so indeed uh, uh, is present with uh, high enough values. Uh, I noted in, in a paper of 2010, I looked at the literature, I found one case for this star well, that was an algol magnetic binary. Uh, numbers that was, were published that would allow to estimate the pointing flux uh, uh, in the interaction of this binary star and the radio power emitted. And uh, quite uh, strangely, actually, a point falls quite close to this line, although the emission is probably gyrosecretal, not a cyclotron maser. So I just leave it here without concluding for that. So of course, if you gain a factor of 10 to the five, uh, it does a lot of good to your detectability in radio because here are again the same curves as before, maximum distance and minimum effective area for the same beta or so bandwidth by integration time that as uh, before, as a function of frequency in the 10 to 100 megahertz range. And you can see that in this case, uh, you can detect uh, uh, targets up to tens or even hundreds of parsecs and uh, with uh, effective areas comparable to the largest instrument here, you have very good capability to detect even bursts of emission. So this was a quite good news. And uh, various papers, there's been a lot of uh, predictive studies, uh, qualitative, quantitative in the literature. It's impossible to review all, but some people have said that turbulence could call intermittency, so strong bursts, that scintillation could do the same, uh, that a young system were more favorable uh, because uh, a stronger stellar wind and a larger planet, coronal mass ejection could increase the efficiency of, uh, of, of the system. There is a question, does, uh, do the planets, especially hot Jupiters, do they keep a magnetic field? Because these planets are uh, spin orbit synchronized by tidal forces, which means that their orbital, uh, that their rotation uh, speed will decrease. And uh, we don't know how to uh, uh, describe magnetic field from the scratch, but again, there were scaling laws that were built for magnetic field uh, um, organization from what is observed. And the magnetic, magnetic moment is very often proportional to some power of the angular rotation of the planet. And so if uh, uh, there is spin orbit synchronization and slow rotation, it could be the, the, the magnetic field decays. But uh, some authors, so these authors, Sanchez La Vega, Rainer Strinsensen, Yadav and Tongren, have uh, made internal structure conversion models. And actually, again, to make the story short, they predicted that the dynamo could be, could be sustained and the, ma the magnetic moment could re remain much larger than a few Gauss, actually, even tens of Gauss in many, many cases. So I would say we have uh, good hope that we have good systems uh, to observe. And in addition, if the star is magnetized, the star-planet interaction can drive radio emission in the star's magnetic field. So uh, in, in that case, the, um, yeah. Uh, if you, for example, uh, take our previous curve, we have Jupiter uh, average and burst, and you multiply this emission by 10 to the five, and you, you place it at five parsec, you have this kind of spectrum. Of course, you don't modify the spectral range, but if you have a stronger magnetic field, you can go to higher frequency. And here you have uh, predicted the flux that can be of the order of a Gauss. And this is easily detectable by a modern radio instrument. Of course, it's 10 to the five, but it also tells you that even weaker amplification factor should be accessible. And actually this was applied by um, uh, Grace Meyer et al in several papers. So 
it was, uh, uh, it's not up to date. It was the most recent, it's uh, the census of exoplanet four years ago. So for these planets, scaling laws were used to predict cyclotron frequency for the planetary emission and uh, flux densities by the, uh, uh, the radiomagnetic scaling law that I presented to you. And so it does not include the uh, induced emission, the star planet induced emission, uh, because it, you should have also made a field of star, but even for magnetospheric emission, compared to the sensitivity limits of various instruments, you have not many, but a number of points above the detection limits. So in principle, it tells you that it is worth trying to detect, but you will have a weak signal. And actually your signatures, your very important signature for a signal is circular polarization that is predicted by cyclotron maser, very important. The sky is generally not circularly polarized and periodic periodicity of the emission at the rotation of the planet, which means for hot Jupiter at the orbital uh, period. Uh, some papers even uh, looked at uh, detailed uh, stellar magnetic field determined by Zeeman Doppler imaging. And then there was field extrapolation that was done by some models. And then the planet was put uh, to orbit into this field that is variable along the orbit. And some time variation of the radio signature could be predicted. Uh, very strong, hundreds of millijens in the case, for example, of HG 189.73, but very variable also. And this was done in this paper, for example. And so this guides the observation that we want to do because this observation we know they will be difficult. And so it's good to have guidelines. And even some early papers, uh, Wilson Wood totally independently looked at uh, the terrestrial planet white dwarf interaction and uh, reached a very similar Io Jupiter. Uh, 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 interaction and magnetic uh, scaling law uh, on their own. They studied the light half of, of, light half of the system. And actually they found that uh, in this case, uh, many, many gigahertz radio emission of uh, typically uh, uh, micro Jensky or up to milli Jensky could be predicted for this very strongly magnetized white dwarf that are also interesting targets, especially when we'll have SK8. But even now it's interesting. Now, a, a brief parenthesis for the motivation of all these studies. Okay, we have, we have uh, determined the emission drive. So we know very well the radio emission mechanism, but we cannot transpose them uh, in unknown places to, to de determine intensities. So we have uh, identified emission drivers, uh, made scaling laws, extrapolated them. So why do we do all that? The, the main reason is that we don't know well the magnetic field of the exoplanets. We have very uh, poor, very little ways to measure them. So this is, for example, the mass radius relationship for uh, all known planets and uh, including solar system planets in red and exoplanets in black. And these points go across the airbags that correspond to pure hydrogen, pure water, pure rock, pure iron. And we have only, uh, and you see, for example, Jupiter is here, Saturn is here, but uh, the magnetic field of Jupiter is much stronger than the magnetic field of Saturn, uh, which is itself weaker than that of the Earth of Uranus. So actually, there is no easy way to determine magnetic field from the observable parameter like mass and radius. And in addition, uh, you can see from this, from this sketch in each box here, there is a different planet from solar system. And without going into details, uh, when you study them de in detail, you found that their structure and the dynamics of all magnetosphere is very different. In some cases, it's con controlled by the solar wind convection, in some cases by the co-rotation, in some cases, the magnetic field is tilted. Uh, in some cases, the magnetosphere is very big. In some cases, it's very small. And so there is basically no room for particular acceleration. So it's very, very variable. And we are more or less in the same situation as uh, before the detection of the, the, the discovery of hot Jupiters with uh, solar system uh, model, formation models. Uh, everybody tried to form uh, rocky planets close to the sun, giant planets far from the sun. And where, when hot Jupiters were found, it just changed everybody and we everything and we could do population studies. And here we would like to have many more magnetospheres detected, magnetic field and magnetospheres detected in order to do population studies and see what are the general characteristics uh, that apply to populations of exoplanets. In addition, with a former student of mine, Sebastian S, we have used the express simulation, the model of uh, dynamic spectra that was very successful for Jupiter and Saturn, for example. And we have applied it to uh, do predictions from exoplanets. And so our uh, purpose was depending on the dynamic spectra, so time frequency images that we would observe with intensity here and polarization here, 
depending on what we observe, what can we deduce on the uh, system that we observe? And actually, again, I don't have time to go in detail, so I refer you to this paper, but we showed that we could determine depending the revolution period of the system, the rotation period of the planet, see if both are uh, synchronous, the type of interaction, if it is a rather star planet interaction or uh, magnetospheric emission, if the emission comes from all uh, latitude, longitudes or from some spots, uh, the tilt and the amplitude of the magnetic field, and even some information about the plasma by the low frequency uh, uh, um, cutoff of the emission and the orbit inclination here. So we can draw actually a very large number of interesting uh, parameters on the system that cannot be obtained by other means uh, if we detect radio emission in the time frequency plane with enough signal to noise ratio, typically a few dB. And this is summary. We can uh, learn about planetary magnetic field and tilt, so about dynamo and planetary interior structure. We can measure planetary rotation and so confirm directly spin orbit locking. We have access to orbit inclination, perhaps presence of satellite, the type and energetic of star plasma interaction. There are implications for exobiology, uh, atmospheric escape, erosion, the protection from the bombardment of the atmosphere. To, for me, the most important is the comparative exomagnetospheric physics. So as I said, population studies in order really to see what are the general characteristics and the and the specific characteristic of magnetospheres. And uh, it could be a discovery tool uh, when it will be working well, for example, for planets around uh, active stars that cannot be measured by, uh, by uh, uh, transit, for example. A few comments, because this scaling law is still a very crude and very approximate law. So first, I looked a long time ago, it's not published, about the relation between the aurora radio power that I measured integrated for the five planets of solar system and uh, some uh, rotation related quantities, period, angular frequency, co-rotation electric field. And there is some small correlation with the correlation electric field, but uh, not very clear. There was some very detailed studies by Nichols, 2011 and 12, that studied the influence of uh, the mass loading of the magnetosphere by a body like Io, for example, and the rotation speed of the, the planet. And that, did, that uh, computed in detail the magnetosphere ionosphere coupling, so like Jupiter, and finally, the radio emission, uh, so the scale is given here, that can be uh, produ produced, and you can reach quite large numbers, like this is 10 to the 5 Jupiter, but only if the planet is rotating very fast, so like 10 times faster than Jupiter, so in one hour, and uh, also if the uh, XU reflux from the central star is very high, that uh, completely ionize the uh, magnetosphere, and it works only uh, also better, but it only slightly depends on the mass loading of the magnetosphere by the internal, for example, uh, satellite or rings or whatever. Uh, they were also uh, uh, oh sorry, I did not uh, the, the, uh, I did not put the indices and, and so on. There was also some uh, some uh, very detailed works that were done uh, in order to refine the study of satellite planet direction by Sauer et al. So the pointing flux. Uh, was uh, was found there. So the expression that I found in my papers was uh, found again by Joachim you, Sauer and colleagues, but with a small corrective factor, which is uh, two to six times V over Alven velocity, V over VA. And this is quite close to one, actually. Uh, the worst case is, is it can reduce by a factor of 10, the prediction of the radiomagnetic scaling law. And this factor is partly absorbed in my uh, epsilon factor, but mostly on many orders of magnitude, the, uh, the, the general uh, behavior remains. There was also a very nice paper by Nicole and Milan 2016 that refined this time the solar wind magnetosphere interaction, computed the magnetospheric convection, and showed that actually the convection potential, so that is across the magnetosphere that will uh, accelerate the plasma and, and uh, feed the, um, the solar wind uh, controlled emission, uh, it is saturated. The mechanism of saturation is not completely understood. It could be through a limited reconnection of metopause or, or Alvin wave reflection of the planet. So there are several papers cited in this one. And it could lead this saturation to a reduction of 1 to 1.5 orders of magnitude compared to the naive, I would say, my radio scaling. Uh, there is a, a paper I participated to by a, a colleague of yours, Jacobo Varela, uh, in Spain, that is doing num numerical simulations in order to estimate in various configurations the dissipated power. And so this could help 
to quantify the, uh, the, the function, functional variation of this scaling law. As a summary, I would say this scaling law is, is really approximative. It is order of magnitude uh, correct only for order of magnitude, but it allows order of magnitude prediction and it allows source selection to target your sources for observation. Uh, interestingly, there is, there is an application of the general radiomagnetic board's law. I don't like the term board's law, but it was, I prefer scaling law, but it was much of used in the literature. Uh, uh, in 2003, five, uh, there was an optical hotspot observed on this uh, planet and this star in the calcium line that was attributed to an orbiting planet that was known because it was supposed to be modulated at the phase of the orbiting planet. So these are observation residuals, power versus the time, and this versus rotational phase of the star, nothing, and orbital phase of the planet, it's clearly organized. So it's this kind of interaction here. And at that time, uh, I wrote in a paper that uh, uh, the, the power involved in the interaction uh, implied either a very large magnetic field for a star or a very large obstacle size because it could not work. The power was too big for that. And actually, uh, the magnetic field for the star was determined by some way uh, to be only three Gauss. But recently, a paper by Cowley et al. Uh, 2018 in Nature Astronomy uh, showed that the, uh, the so there, this is uh, where, from where this figure, the very nice figure is extracted. They showed that actually for the red point for HD 179949, uh, they could find an estimated value with a lot of uncertainty, but an estimated value of several tens of Gauss for this planet. And so very oddly, a much larger magnetic field than the star, so very large obstacle. And indeed, in this case, you can reach with the radio magnetic board law, this 10 to the 20 watts. So these authors uh, did not uh, uh, think useful to, to cite our early criticism. That is too bad, but th that's the point. There was also a very nice paper about the uh, the phase of the orbital signal, because when you have a planet in orbit, uh, the interaction between the planet and the star is not radial. It should go back along the magnetic field of the spiral at the Alven velocity. And uh, so it takes some time, and it means that any uh, uh, implication on the star radio or hotspot will be out of phase with respect to the position of the planet. Okay, I don't read this very complicated. I just wanted to, I wanted to let it in the, uh, in the, 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 the recording, but uh, in the handbook of exoplanets that was published in 2018 and updated in 2020, uh, I tried to gather everything that we knew about flow obstacle obst interaction, depending on the uh, magnetic field of the flow, small or large, uh, Alven, uh, well, uh, Alven character, sub superalvenic, subalvenic, the magnetic field of the obstacle, and to find known examples or uh, expected star planet interaction for that. And all that I told you is uh, typically listed here with expected radio signature from Cyclotron Maser here. And a very interesting thing is that in this, uh, in this general frame, there is uh, one very odd example that also takes its place. It is some uh, studies that we have done with Fabrice Motez and uh, Guillaume Voisin about pulsar planet interactions that could, be, uh, that could give rise to Alven waves and, cyclotron and, and radio emission that could explain fast radio bursts. So I don't have the time to detail that, but that's a fact. Uh, there was uh, in this uh, NASA report from Keck Institute for Space uh, Studies, uh, some uh, preliminary uh, UV board law in solar system that is also related to the same kind of physics. And finally, I think I don't have the time to go through observation. So let me just show you so that it's pretty. I have two slides. One slide is for quite past observations, say beyond the 2018, and that were done with many instruments and in many range from 10 uh, megahertz to four gigahertz. And uh, all of them are negative. There were hints, but never confirmed of detection. And more recently, we have still negative results with LOFAR, but we start, we start to have positive results with LOFAR and with ATCI by Miguel, Perez uh, Torres especially, with some uh, polarized signal, circularly polarized, variable with frequency and with time, so here again, some circular polarization, perhaps uh, with the orbital period of the planet. The, the final proof for me will be to see the radio signal circularly polarized and variable at the orbital period of a known planet. This will be, as we say, the smoking gun uh, evidence for detection. So this is really the tip of the iceberg that seems to, to come out uh, of the water, but it needs to be confirmed uh, still. 
Uh, one interesting uh, one, one remark I want to do is that uh, this methodology of looking for unresolved, uh, weak, polarized emission, time variable, actually the same to search for stellar emissions. And there were very interesting works done by Halinan, by Austin, and very recently by Zik to detect uh, polarized flares. And this polarized flare isn't for, for, from flare stars like ADLEO or from uh, some cool dwarf or from Proxima Century here with ASCAP at uh, about gigahertz here. They are uh, very interesting because they give uh, very interesting information uh, about the presence of cyclotron, the operation of cyclotron maser in stellar environment, the uh, star planet plasma interaction, space weather in these systems. And finally, this is my last slide. Uh, we have a lot of uh, bright perspective for observation, and uh, so we should also improve the theory. And I did not by far, I mean, uh, uh, review the whole literature, our paper by Lanza, by Leto, and a lot, a lot of predictions, but it's impossible to go through. Uh, we have uh, the possibility to explore very deep the surveys, especially the low far survey, uh, the, the survey in, uh, in uh, high band, low band, decameter. We have a many far survey starting. We, can we have started to implement a new method that is a kind of integral uh, field spectroscopy uh, in software in these surveys, and it's very promising. LOFAR should be, should be updated in LOFAR 2.0 in the coming uh, three years, typically, and there are uh, expressions of intents concerning exoplanets that have been submitted by Vedanta et al., by Perestores et al., uh, some survey that is also relevant by Degasperin et al. We have NANUFAR that is coming in for the very low frequencies. We have, of course, of course Mer Mercat at uh, high frequency in the southern hemisphere and SKA that will be coming at the horizon. Here I indicated SKA low, but SKA mid will be also very interesting. And I thank you and I leave you. If you want to uh, go beyond that, these are all cited reference. I realized that I forgot one, Saleh, from where I took the, the picture from Alvin Ways. I will add it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sarka. And uh, now the uh, talk is open for questions. Miguel will uh, manage this session. So, Miguel, please. Okay, so yeah, there is. Um, well, thank you very much, first of all, Philippe, for this wonderful talk. A lot of information. I, I think uh, this has been very, very useful uh, um, to me, certainly, and I hope for most uh, attendees. <laughs> Not to all. Um, let me ask if anyone has a question. If not, I have a number of them. I don't see any. I don't, oh, let me see if in the second page. No. So, so let me then let me then start so to warm up with some questions. So um, one of the things actually that um, came um, as a surprise. Well, as a surprise, as a question to myself, but I, I drop it to you because you you show this beautiful UV aurora in Jupiter is that basically the, the UV aurora is seen in the atmosphere, but the low frequency coherent emission from the cyclotron is from the, of course, the magnetosphere, which is above. Yes. So, so why, I mean, um, is it, so I mean, is in the, it comes from different, <coughs> from two different sites, but um, uh, there is the, now you show this UV both law that, you know, has it. So what is then the basis? I mean, what, because in the end, you know, it, it comes, it, bo it, be, it seems to boil down to the same, the same yes. physics in the end, but why is it that uh, the UV, UV aurora is happening in the atmosphere? I mean, I, and let me just formulate a second question that uh, was asked to, my, to, to me also, is that, well, uh, couldn't it be that this low frequency emission comes from the atmosphere? My understanding is that you need these field lines and these kilo electron volts to, to have this, this emission. So you need to have this in the, in the magnetosphere of the planet, there is no way to produce this kind of radio emission from the atmosphere, but maybe. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, to, uh, I'll try to, to respond shortly. So uh, the, uh, the uh, UV aurora comes from the atmosphere because actually, and we observe it on Earth also, really, we know that it comes from between 70 and uh, typically 200 kilometers. And this comes uh, from the fact that uh, uh, incoming electrons are keV to, to tens or hundreds of keV will bombard the atmosphere and the collision with the atmospheric atoms and excite them. And we can observe in the aurora from the Earth, a line that correspond to the de-excitation of oxygen, of uh, nitrogen. And so, so, so the, the, the bombarding electrons just, just excite the atmospheric particles. And then they de-excite by emitting the UV emission. But actually, 
you cannot produce cyclotron radio emission uh, in the atmosphere itself because the mean free pass of the, 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 the particle around the magnetic field, around the cyclotron, is very small. There will be collisions immediately, and they will be lost by collision. And this is indeed the origin of the lost cone that you see above them. The particles that come down and that go too deep because they have a, a velocity that is too parallel to the field, their mirror point is very low, so they are lost by collision. So actually, to have a free cyclotron motion, you can have it only above the atmosphere. So why would there be correlation between the UV and radio emissions? Because the electrons that produce both emissions are accelerated by the same processes in the magnetosphere. It's just that the fraction of the population that is most parallel to the field will go deep and bombard the atmosphere and produce the UV, whether the fraction that is less parallel will be reflected at the mirror point have a non-Maxwellian distribution and produce a radio wave. But basically, the, the acceleration mechanism that is ahead of that is the same for everybody. Right. And this is why it's correlated. And the last point was, uh, there was a last part of the question that I forgot. No, I, th uh, I think you have, you have answered the, the, the question very nicely, <laughs> very clearly. So that's because the two were related. So actually, okay. I'm, I, I see there was Parvin <laughs> who I wanted to ask a question. I, I think it, 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 this must be related, but uh, go ahead, Parvin. Um, hi, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, hi, thank you so much, Professor, for the great talk. Uh, I had this one question about the um, dipolar cases. Um, can we have uh, maybe a synchrotron emission um, besides um, cyclotron? Uh, because um, in dipolar cases, then we have two magnetized body, especially when they are uh, so close together. Maybe the um, a magnetic field is so uh, tangled, and they can accelerate um, uh, particles to higher uh, velocities. So, um, can we have uh, this kind of emission, and um, can it be a possibility to detect them in synchrotron uh, uh, emission? Oh, uh, several several pieces of response. Um, okay, Jupiter, uh, that is far from the sun, has very strong radiation belts, as you know, that are between two and six radii, basically, and so with electrons and protons up to tens of MeV, actually, mega electrons. And so, um, and this is because the rapid rotation uh, creates very strong electric field that will accelerate this electron, and uh, there will be a successive acceleration. The electrons are trapped between their mirror points. So they go from one pole to the other. And then there is a reservoir of very high energy particles that um, will, will emit synchrotron emission, linearly polarized, that, are very, that is very well observed with DNA, with, uh, with uh, low car. With, okay. Now, if you have a, a magnetic binary, so in bipolar interaction, I would suspect that it, will, it would actually be unfavorable for the uh, synchrotron emission. Why? It is first magnetic field does not accelerate particles. So the electric field accelerates particles, and um, I, and in order to accelerate particles to a high enough energy, so mega electron volt, to produce synchrotron emission, it's better to have a stable geometry like the rotation of the radiation belt of Jupiter than uh, uh, an, uh, an entangled geometry that will actually uh, make the particle be lost in one or the other object at the end of the field line. So I, I don't, I'm not categorical, but I think it's not easy to find um, places in a, in a dipolar interaction where you can have a reservoir particle that can be accelerated to such higher energy. Now, the second part of the question is, uh, why did my talk not uh, address synchrotron emission? Well, you have seen in my first spectrum that uh, for Jupiter, uh, this is, uh, the spectrum of Jupiter, when you go above 40 megahertz, the intensity drops by five orders of magnitude. And why is that? It's because you pass from cyclotron maser emission, that is cyclotron emission, so that is yeah. the fundamental of cyclotron frequency, that can exist only up to 40 MHz because the magnetic field of the planet does not exceed 40 Gauss. Yeah. And, the, and this cyclotron maser emission is a coherent emission. Whereas the synchrotron emission is non-thermal, of course, but it's incoherent. And so the mechanism, the synchrotron mechanism is much less efficient uh, than the cyclotron yeah. maser. And so these five order of magnitudes really kill you because you have two problems if you want to detect synchrotron emission from exoplanets. One is first, 
you have uh, you start uh, like the tortoise with five order of magnitude late delay as compared to the the cyclic measure emission, and then it's not obvious to uh, find a, a physical reason for which the uh, cyclotron uh, emission from exoplanets would be much stronger than Jupiter's. Because this, again, the process is not related to the star planet interaction, it's rather the fast rotation and the reservoir. So you could have faster rotating planets, you can have efficient, but I don't expect to gain more than one or two others of magnitude with respect to Jupiter and not five like here. And in this case, because you have five order of magnitude less at the beginning, you cannot gain much. I think it's a little hopeless. Well, now there is another side. It's that synchrotron emission. You can detect it up to much higher frequency. At these higher frequencies, the sky is much darker, so you can uh, be sensitive to a few tens of micro density. So maybe it's still feasible, but uh, um, I, I think it's not very easy. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks a lot, Pavin. If you could mute now, uh, I will give the word to Fabio del Sordo and then Pedro Amado. Who <coughs> has the so, Fabio, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for a very nice talk. I have a question related to the yes, observability of uh, possible um, both unipolar and dipolar um, interaction for exoplanets. And it's related to the geometry. So, um, would it be more favorable to observe uh, this kind of interactions for uh, transiting exoplanets or for a uh, phase on uh, planet uh, systems and if if there is a difference and in case uh, we are observing a, a transiting system um, what is the most favorable well at least in theory what the most favorable uh, configuration the um, quadrature for instance or when the planet is really transiting so uh, I can respond to part of that. First, uh, for I would say uh, very simple geometries like a uh, deep polar like magnetic field from the star, uh, obviously uh, we can detect transiting bodies because we detect the IO induced emission from Jupiter and IO and Ganymede are transiting uh, bodies actually. They are, they are, they are, we see them uh, in the equatorial plane basically. So actually it's the same geometry, Io Jupiter is same geometry as a transiting planet. And we do see indeed the emission. In this case, the emission is best seen when the, the, bot, the orbiting body is in quadrature with respect to it, both quadratures actually. And this is, it's uh, really, really a matter of geometry that can be very well simulated by the express code actually. You can imagine that when you have a dipolar like field and an orbiting body that is transiting, the magnetic field line so connects the orbital body to the central field, and the emission is, say, quasi perpendicular to the field. So when the field line is ahead of you, the emission goes to the sides perpendicular. It's not beam toward you. When it's in quadrature, you receive the so more or less in quadrature. It, it's it's not necessarily perpendicular. It can be, I would say, within maybe 30 degrees of 15 or 30 degrees of quadrature. Then, uh, for the, if we see the system now uh, uh, face on. Um, I think that the best to answer you, to not, not to say stupid things, would be to do the express simulation. It could be done. And my guess is that we would detect the system, but with, but with less variability, because we would be in the beam more or less uh, a large fraction of the time. Of course, it will not be true if the magnetic topology is a little complex. If it's distorted, then they, you will have, again, some variation. So I would say, uh, with hollow cones, we should be able to detect system, whatever the topology. It is easier to understand for transiting system with simple magnetic topology. Thank you very much, very clear. And, and we, could, we, could really, we could really simulate it with Express. We could take any magnetic field model for the central object, the geometry of observation, the orbit in the way, and then we produce dynamic spectrum. It could be done. And you're welcome. Uh, we, we have the code here, and it's absolutely usable. Yeah, I, right. as, um, before I give the word to Pedro, as, as you know, Philippe, we will contact you also precisely to do to run your express code for the Proxima Centauri data. Sure. I think there, there might be something ahead. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, let, um, so, Pedro, go ahead. Uh, hello, Philippe. Thanks very much for this very interesting uh, talk. Um, I um, um, was surprised to see uh, AD Neo, which is a star we are 
very interested in for, for other reasons in your presentation at the at the very end. Yeah. Uh, we, we, yes, regarding this this uh, rail bursts, right? Uh, published yeah. by Austin and Bastian. Yeah, it, it, it was, it was a, I would say it's a, it was a simple illustration of stellar bursts, just to illustrate that uh, when you look for <clears throat> uh, planets with time frequency resolution, you can pick bursts. But you are perfectly right by saying that these bursts do not fit in the, in the general picture. It's not, it's very different from the emission from cool dwarfs from uh, Greg Alinan or for the, from the type, uh, type 4 flare from Proxima Centauri from uh, Zik. So it was just for an illustration of uh, burst in the time frequency plane. Yeah, but but uh, for Elio, um, Elio um, has a long story. Um, in particular, when trying to detect planets, because we are still not sure if there is a planet in this system or not. Because um, uh, in principle, the the orbital period would be the same as the rotational period, and for radio velocities, this is. Um, a nuisance because we, we, we cannot um, ascribe uh, the ray of velocity variations to the planet. Uh, but um, uh, many, many different uh, small uh, hints, uh, uh, well, uh, shows us that, the, that there may be a planet there. Um, and uh, I, will, I wanted to ask you if there was a planet in, in, in AD Leo, how would these uh, bursts that are 100% uh, circular, circularized, um, circularly paralyzed um, um, bursts, how, do, how would they uh, fit in, in, this, in this scheme? Well, um, uh, you, you said that the, uh, I've not number in mind, you said that the, uh, why would be the orbital period of a planet uh, identical to the rotation of the star? Well, we see uh, radio velocity variations um, uh, uh, with the same uh, periodicity as the rotation of the, the rotation. star okay. with, from photometry and from other indices. But, but, uh, the, but the, there would be no reason actually for the, uh, for the, uh, the planet to be on the, uh, on the synchronous orbit, right? There is no physical reason. There is no, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, um, Tidal or some reason for that? No. No, in principle, not that we know of. Uh, but there, are, there, are, there are quite a few planets that have been found transiting and that uh, show the same orbital period as the rotation period of the star. That we don't know why they yeah. are synchronized, but uh, this I, I is would, one of the cases. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, from the point of view of the radio emission, uh, if if indeed the orbital period is the same as the rotation period of the, of the star, then we have a problem also because. <laughs> <laughs> because you will also, you will observe okay circularly polarized burst but the cyclotron laser can operate in the stellar corona or uh, induced by the planet um, you will have some complex beaming that will induce some uh, rotational modulation uh, but uh, how to decide between uh, the star and the planet so it's possible that uh, uh, with the polarization information so the the, uh, the sense of polarization and maybe if maybe if we have access to low frequencies, the low frequency cutoff, maybe of the emission, there might be uh, some hints indirectly to, to find, it, but uh, I have to think more and, and to think about simulation. But uh, it's not obvious, for sure. For sure, it will be confusing. Sure. Okay, well, we, we keep talking about this. I will, I will, with pleasure. I will, I will send you a minute. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Thanks all for the question, Pedro and, uh, for, and Philippe. So, um, and more questions? If not, I think, I mean, uh, they have, this has been a very interesting talk, but I think we already are almost one hour and a half, actually, yeah. So maybe if not, I think we can stop, maybe Rene, stop recording and we can now still stay a few minutes with Philippe just to, so to thank you. Okay, uh, so we, we end the talk here and uh, please stay for a few minutes after the end of the recording. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much for attending. Yeah, yeah, but thanks so much.